So, Aiken, thanks for joining ISC Purdue today. Hey, thanks for having me. All right, so starting off with your career at Purdue, you played football, high school football in Irving, Texas. What were some of the key factors that brought you to West Lafayette, Indiana? Yeah, um, you know, I, I grew up, I didn't actually grow up playing football. I played everything else but football. And when I got to high school, I decided to listen. Football is one of the things I wanted to do because everybody around me was doing it. You live in Texas, you're a boy in Texas. It's like football is, is just, it just beat down and that's what you do. And um, I just remember, you know, I, I had a successful high school career. And I remember coming to a choice. I easily could have gone to a lot of schools in the state of Texas, but academics was actually, honestly, was my number one. I say academics, but I wasn't necessarily the best uh, academic student. Uh, and I knew that I needed a school that would challenge me. I, and uh, I, I needed a school that, you know, honestly, I mean, you can take our uh, the degree to say you're from Purdue or you went to Purdue, you know that it, it holds weight and it's recognized. And then I just had a really good, um, rapport and feel for the coaching staff. Uh, you know, prior, uh, I was part of Joe Tiller's first recruiting class. And so obviously prior to that, you know, Purdue was not known for uh, successful seasons with Coletto, but, you know, Joe came from Wyoming, which he was successful there. Uh, Danny Hope, who was also a former Purdue head coach, uh, him and I really got along. Um, Scott Downing, uh, him and I also got along. I was on the same recruiting class as, I believe, Chris Clopton, uh, same recruiting visit as Chris Clopton, um, Cortez Miles, R.K. Sturgeon, um, Mitrion, Vinny. Like, it was so all of us uh, just uh, met each other. We um, just connected. And um, I just decided that Purdue was the place for me. All right. So the, the reason, you know, this is a really big weekend for Purdue football is to celebrate the 20th anniversary of that Rose Bowl team. Um, what was your favorite moment from that 2000, 2001 Rose Bowl season? And what was it like to, to be a part of that Rose Bowl experience? Because a lot of people say the Rose Bowl is a different bowl game than all the other bowl games. It honestly is. Uh, you know, I was lucky and blessed that we had a phenomenal quarterback in Drew Brees that always held it down on the offensive side of the ball. And so we actually got to play in a bowl game every year that I was at Purdue. And just like you said, there's just a huge difference with the uh, with the festivities, with the, uh, the gravity of the game uh, and just the Rose Bowl itself, the granddaddy of them all. You know, it's so, it's so hard to pick one memory from that 2000 season. Uh, there's just so many. You know, I, I can think of the games where, especially early on in the season, where we're still trying to uh, find our identity. And I remember we had lost to Penn State. Penn State also, quick tidbit, was the only team I actually never got to beat uh, while I was there. I remember losing to Penn State. You know, we had just a terrible special teams performance you know, in that game and we just didn't click. I remember being down, you know, just feeling like you were just getting your head bashed in by Michigan in the first half and with, you know, playing against Tom Brady. And, but I remember going to halftime and just thinking that there's no way that we're gonna end up um, or allow this game to go the way it is. And, you know, Matt Mitrion spoke at halftime, I spoke at halftime, Coach Tiller spoke at halftime. And it was just an understanding that we were a team that were built for moments like this, you know? And so going back into the second half, I got moved from, I believe I was playing linebacker in the first half. And then they moved me to defensive end and we did some shuffling around because we needed some more pressure. And, you know, I'm not saying it was totally because of my shift, but we just seemed on the defensive side to really get some momentum going and, and was able to slow down their offense. And then Drew, obviously, in the offense and Vinny and all the guys were able to really click and and um, and just start putting up points. And one, one of our philosophies on the defensive side, we knew that if we can just give the offense the ball, that they were going to put points up. And that was the one thing that we trusted. We trusted Drew, we trusted Matt Light protecting them. Uh, we, we trusted our running game. We trusted the receivers, whoever it was, that really they would catch the ball and make plays. And so there's so many positive things that you take from that season. And obviously, just to finish the, your question, 
it was the one of the, another huge memory um, that always it's just etched into my mind. We played Indiana. No, we played Notre Dame the last game. No, no, no. We played. It was Indiana, and we won. Obviously, we won the Big Ten, and the crowd, the fans, the alumni, the student section, all pouring down to the field. The celebration afterwards, and seeing that sea of people, you know, just being elated and happy for us, you know, that to me just um, just said it all because you knew how important it was for the university, for the city, for uh, the school, and everything that we'd worked for uh, finally came through. Awesome. Um, so talking about this 20th anniversary Rose Bowl team, is there anyone uh, on the team you still keep in touch with on a regular basis? Yeah, I keep in touch with a lot of guys. Um, you know, I, I talked to Chris Clopton, Arquette Starling. Um, I talked to Kelly Butler, who was, I think, a freshman at the time. Stu Swagger. Uh, Sean, I spoke with Sean Phillips today. You know, he was, he was my partner in crime. Um, so it's still a lot of guys, every blue moon, you know, I, you know, me and Drew text, um, you know, so there's still, and I think that's one of the cool things about just having, um, having been in college and being with guys that you played with and you trust and, you know, you ate, slept and did everything with is, uh, and when you have great memories and great moments like that, you find reasons to connect and to stay in touch. And so there's a lot of guys that I still stay in connection with. Um, to go on that, uh, do you have a favorite memory of the late, great coach, Cowboy Joe Tiller? Oh, so Joe, Joe. Uh, coach Tiller, so many memories. Um, you know, the one thing that I always I managed to tell people that what I learned from Joe, I, you know, coach always played, he was such, he was always playing a mind game with you. And I came in there as a Southern kid who was in West Lafayette, Indiana, knew nothing about the cold or how extreme cold it got. So I'll tell you a quick story. I remember my first in 99 when I first got there and one of the coldest practice we had, you know, I was, there's no way I'm going outside and practicing and just shoulder pads, long sleeves, you know, and, and no long socks. So I put my starter jacket underneath my shoulder pads and walked outside to practice and Joe, Joe Tiller looks at me, Coach Tiller looks at me and shakes his head and points back to the locker room, says, go take that off. And tells Mike Shandrick to go in my locker, take all my warm sleeve shirts, socks or whatever, and give me all short sleeve shirts and just the tube socks and have me wear that and come back out. But because of that, and I fought it tooth and nail, but because of that, from that day forward, I just knew how important the, the mental game, the mindset of preparing yourself and going into every game. So in my career, I never wore long sleeves um, on game day because of that. Um, so not sure when your last time on campus has been, but uh, in the last few years, Purdue built a brand new football performance complex. Um, how, how do you think college football has changed in the last 20 years from when you were at Purdue to now? It's evolved. It's evolved, um, you know, there's pros and cons, but I think the modern day athlete uh, definitely needs more than we did. You know, one of the things that when I first got to, when I came on my recruit visit, you know, the locker room wasn't a big deal. It didn't wow me. It wasn't a part of my decision to come to Purdue. Whereas the Monday athlete, they need the pizzazz. They need um, the glamour as well. They need the recognition. If you look at how social media and digital media has played a huge impact on uh, recruiting these days. Um, you know, you know, whereas I think back in when I played, or I can say back in my days, honestly, it was just about finding comfort in the place um, and, and, and relating to the coaching staff. While that aspect of it is still there, I think there's so many other tools that the modern day athlete needs, deservingly so, uh, but it's just been a whole completely different game. And I, and I, but I do believe that Purdue made the right decision when they built that complex, because I think part of being successful from a win loss uh, metric is you, you have to recruit the, the right kind of athlete uh, for your program. And the athletes of today need those types of um, facilities uh, to attract them and want to also be part of a program. 
Um, last one about Purdue. Uh, who are your mentors at Purdue and uh, what kind of impact do they have on your life? Oh, huge. Uh, you know, great question. You know, if to this day, even the guys that I really leaned on and were people who advised me, um, who I looked up to are still part of my life. Um, you know, we're talking about Leroy Keys. Leroy was my surrogate father while I was there. And even though he wasn't a coach, he was one of the people that my first year was tough, uh, was tough at Purdue because I was a Southern kid uh, in the Midwest and, and there's, there's cultural differences. You know, I was stubborn and so not knowing necessarily how to adapt, but he was one of those people that really I could lean on and help me talk through, you know, situations that I was uncomfortable with. Um, uh, one of my teammates, um, Adrian Beasley, who's also a captain, you know, at Purdue, uh, was a guy that I looked up to because he was he he was a guy that worked hard every single day, um, gave you everything he had, and was a good, sound, solid leader. Um, you know, he's a guy that I still communicate with and you know still talk to and you know, keep up with. Um, you know, and just across the board, there are some student, uh, some some people who are part of the uh, administration, um, who was also uh, Heather Ryan, who was uh, a friend of the program, a tutor, an advisor, also was somebody that, you know, was always somebody that I could also lean on as well. So all these people are still part of my life. And I think it's been, it's played a huge part on who I've become and some of my successes in life. All right. Uh, to go on to your, your NFL career, um, what was your most memorable experience in the NFL? Yeah, I have a good one for that. Uh, my rookie year, I was I got drafted by the Jaguars in the third round. And being from Irving, Texas, we were playing the Cowboys um, probably midway through the season. And the, the media knew that I was from Dallas and we're playing at Dallas. And so it was, I kept getting these interviews and they said, well, what are you going to do when you face Emmitt Smith? And the, what the linebacker does, we talk trash, right? You know, and, and I did that. And the week before, I believe, uh, we played the Cowboys, Emmett had just rushed for the Russian title, all-time uh, Russian leader. And so it was a game that I was starting. And I remember probably the first or second game, it was a run to um, our right. And I shot the gap, hit the, the guard, shot the gap, tackled Emmett Smith. And I remember taking him to the ground and I just had this flashback of, wow, like this is Emmett Smith. This is the guy that you used to look up to and you, you know, you had the posters of the triplets and the guy that, you know, used to won three Super Bowls. Like, how could you tackle him? And in the split second, I thought of all that and I got up real fast and I grabbed him and put him up and I apologized for tackling him. <laughs> and, <laughs> and my teammates looked at me and said, what? And they made fun of me and clowned me that whole entire week, but you know, it happens. So uh, who, who was the hardest person to tackle during your NFL career? Who was the, the, the slipperiest? Ooh, oh, there's some good one. That's a good question. For me personally, I would say one of the toughest guys to, to tackle uh, was Adrian Peterson. Um, um, Adrian brought it every single time he caught the ball. And, you know, if, if, if you were out of, out of place and, you know, didn't have good form, he usually would run through your tackle and, you know, and give you a headache on the way. How did the NFL change you as a man? Um, it, it really helped me to understand the professionalism that you have to bring every single day. Um, one of the things that you learn right away that it's, it's a grown man's game. And you have grown men who, are, who have bills, who have family, and to compete, you know, every single day. It could be walkthroughs, you're competing. You know, it could be tic-tac-toe, you're competing. It could be, you know, just, um, you know, practicing in shells, you're competing. And you have to bring your A game every single time. And so it really shows, it really exposes the people who have the desire to compete and the, and the passion behind of uh, playing a game. And one of the things that I respect about that is because at any given time, you know, it could be your last game, it could get cut. And so you had to bring your A game every single day. And it taught me that of just about life outside of the field is, you know, just being professional, uh, being a hard worker, um, always showing up, being a man of your word. Um, and those are the attributes that, you know, you try to live by just because those were the things that 
helped you to be successful to play almost a decade in the National Football League. Now, I wasn't necessarily a big name, but I was a guy who every season I, I was a starter. I was a guy who they didn't necessarily pay, you know, big dollars to, but, you know, all my coaches respected me and knew that they could count on me. All my teammates who really, that's who you really want to have the respect most, always respected me and gave me, you know, the appreciation of always showing up, always being accountable. And those are the things that, that you look to, you know, every day outside of the field as well. All right. Well, that's some great stuff, not only from your Purdue days and your NFL days, but uh, let's talk about some of the impressive things that you've done post NFL career. So not only did you get your bachelor's degree at Purdue, but uh, during your playing career, you got an entrepreneurial degree from Harvard Business School. And then also you attained an MBA at George Washington. So tell us a uh, Tell us some things about the activities or causes right now that you're passionate about. Uh, I mean, it's a great question. Um, you know, I, I've always had a sense of community. Um, I grew up in a big family. You know, mom raised four of us by herself, but, you know, she was involved in community growing up. And you know, one of the things that I've tried my my best and use my platform is to find areas in our community that you know need needs help. And one of the, my causes is youth. Um, you know, youth and education is a huge thing. I am dyslexic. I, um, I have ADHD. Uh, you know, and I was diagnosed early with that, but it wasn't necessarily something that I understood. And so I had my issues in education and learning. And, I, and so I used our foundation, I used my foundation, which is called the Dream Builders Foundation, to really uh, find areas all across the country. We partner with professional athletes all across the country to uh, serve their communities in education, extracurricular activities, and nutrition. Um, I also use, one of the things I enjoy doing is uh, speaking. Um, I speak to corporations, to education, um, uh, educational uh, uh, groups, uh, veterans, and it's always something I think about of uh, uplifting and using my voice to uh, help people see a new light and to uh, honestly believe in believe in the things that they are created to do. I'm a man of faith. My faith drives me in everything that I do. Um, so I'm I'm also involved in uh, faith-based organizations as well. Um, you know, so these are some of the things that you know I I, I I've reached to and very. Uh, I, show, I try to show a lot of effort and, and, and drive a lot of passion behind. All right, so we, we got one last thing for you. We're going to put you on the spot a little bit here. So imagine, imagine you're Purdue's head football coach. You're going into the game tomorrow. Two undefeated teams for the Big Ten West lead. How are you going to motivate the team? What's, what's going to be your pregame speech to the team? So from what I have watched so far, um, you know, one of the things that I, I definitely have to continue is you have to keep your, your, your team, you have to build their confidence, you know, and I would, I would go down the line, I would just try to pick out guys that I know that one are game changers, you know, David Bell, you know, he's, he's a guy that, you know, comes in, in and out every single game and performs. You know, and I think those are the guys that you have to continue and let them know that the importance of them making the plays, making the plays they're supposed to and making the plays they're not supposed to. And I think number two is you really have to help your team really understand the importance of uh, uh, being disciplined and just grinding. Regardless of what the score is, you know, you have to grind because the games are not, games are not won and lost in the first quarter. Games are won and lost, you know, in the fourth quarter when everything is on the line. So whether you're up by 10 points or whether you're down by 10 points, you finish every single play like it's your last. You know, whether uh, you, you got hurt and you had to miss a couple plays, you know, in the first quarter, you know, when you get back in the game, you play like it's your last, you know. And I think if you can show effort, you know, in every single play, then usually you'll see the positive things happen. You see things start turning around and you start to have the ball you know, fall, you know, your way. So, you know, that's, 
what I'll tell them because it, it really doesn't matter that both teams are undefeated. It really doesn't matter that you know this is to lead you know your division. What matters is you have to you you have to finish what you started. All right, Aiken. Well, I appreciate your time. Some great stories there from your time here in West Lafayette in the NFL, and you're, you're doing some amazing things. Uh, we'll put a few links out there in the description for how people can uh, get more detail. Uh, we're going to definitely put your website on there, akinadel.com, uh, to go to. And uh, with that, we're going to sign off. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in for another Indiana sports coverage interview. And boiler up, hammer down.